Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our coverage of HFES 2018. My name is Nick Rome. I'm joined by Blake Arnsdorf. And today we have Susan Hallback here. Uh, Susan, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Blake. It's good to be here. I'm glad you're here with us. Thanks. So, Susan, you have just assumed the role of president-elect within HFES, the organization. Um, And today, I kind of just want to kind of let our listeners in on um, some of the intricacies of the organization. But first, I want to get into who are you and and sort of what's your job experience and where did you come from and... and, uh, how did you get to where you are now? Let's let's start with that. That's a long loaded question, but that's that's a long question. <laughs> Tell us everything about yourself. Alrighty. So, I didn't even think about engineering in high school until near the end of high school when my ed, uh, career counselor said, you know, to to some of the the guys in my class, engineering is a really great field. You know, you're smart. Go do that. And then he said to me, you know, nursing is a great field. And I went my dad's an engineer. How come I can't be an engineer? And I went home and my dad said, yeah, you should be an engineer. Let's pick your school. And so then I I figured out I wanted to be in engineering, but I didn't know what kind. I'd never heard of industrial engineering. I certainly had not heard of human factors engineering. And so I started out as a mechanical engineer. And what they said in my sophomore year was, you'll draw turbines in your own office and you won't have to interact with any humans. And I went, wait. I didn't sign on for that. (laughs) What do I do now? So then I found industrial engineering, and I was really happy because it was a great field that was very broad. And I was like, now what in that do I want to do? Human factors just jumped out at me as the thing that made my heart sing. Dealing with humans, fixing problems, and making everything better. That was what I wanted to do. So then I, I was graduating with my undergraduate, and I thought I could get a job. And they said, wait, you need a master's. What? What's a master's? <laughs> what do I need to do for that? And so then I, I got a NIOSH fellowship in Texas Tech, and they, I got a master's. And while I was there, I taught a class. I said, I like that faculty thing. How does one do that? And they said, you need a PhD. Really? You're killing me. <laughs> so then I went off to Virginia Tech to get my PhD. And then I got a faculty position in industrial engineering where I was able to do teaching and research and mentoring that led to more research. And so it was a great job. And then the Mayo Clinic came calling and they offered me a position that's mostly research, some mentoring, not a lot of teaching, but I now get to put my tools into practice. I'm able to make changes in practice at Mayo Clinic and the entire Mayo Clinic is my lab. So I'm very lucky. And could you just go over what the Mayo Clinic is for somebody who may be unfamiliar with it? The Mayo Clinic is the uh, the highest ranked hospital in the United States. It has a main campus in Rochester, Minnesota, which is where I'm located. Um, It has two other hospitals in Arizona and Florida, and it has a health system in the Midwest. It is also the subject of a new Ken Burns documentary that came out last week. (laughs) It's it's a very large quaternary hospital system where we take the tip of the pyramid, is what they call it, patients whom other people have said that they can't help, and then we try to help them. So it's a lot of very, very sick people. And sorry, go ahead, Blake. Go ahead, Blake. I was just going to ask, like, how's the transition for you been from moving from academia to now, like, still doing research, but you're, like you said, the entire Mayo Clinic is your laboratory. How awesome has that got to feel? Kid in a candy store. <laughs> Seriously. That's Seriously. Amazing. The thing that I, that is the big change is I can't wear jeans. And the, it's a year long thing instead of having my summers off. The trade off? totally worth it awesome (laughs) and just to give our listeners a kind of sense of what's the kind of research that you conduct there 
So I'm primarily doing research in the operating rooms. Okay. So I go in and I, I'm looking at the physical workload of the surgeons. A colleague of mine is looking at the mental workload of the surgeons. What we're finding is that about half of the surgeons fear for their career longevity, that they are going out with musculoskeletal disorders by mid-50s. And they don't actually, in the United States, get to be fully-fledged surgeons until they're about 35. It's a little bit earlier in Europe and, and other places because they have an undergraduate in medicine rather than an undergraduate than medical school in, in Europe, for example. But it's still, you're still 30, 35 by the time you get to be a full-fledged surgeon and on your own practice. And there are people who are going out with musculoskeletal disorders, multiple surgeries, not able to hold a scalpel at 50 or 55. And that's, that is just a terrible thing, personally, professionally, and for society, to lose those high-functioning surgeons so early in their careers. Yeah, that's, yeah, I can't even imagine putting in all that time and effort into something like that and then not being able to follow through with it for what you thought might be you Right, know, your the rest entire, of your career, yeah, until exactly. you decided to leave. And I think of it from my perspective because, you know, some of these people are my age, and I, and I think, what if somebody told me I couldn't do the thing I love? It'd be more yeah. difficult than, than really you can imagine because your, your personal and your professional lives are, are mixed into that as well. And right. their quality of life is not great. Right. That is so, so hard to even kind of like wrap my head around because that's, that's just not a whole lot of time for something that you've like really, in, in that aspect, you've gone beyond just like studying really hard. You're right. really good at craft. Right. Uh, and it's something you need. I mean, so with the research that you do, are you finding ways that you may be able to sustain longer kind of career paths for them or ways to kind of help with interventions that allow them to keep working? Yes. So that's, that is the goal. So one of the first things that we had to do is bring awareness because all of them were hurting, but they didn't tell anybody and they'd go away and they'd, you know, have a cervical laminectomy, have their shoulder redone, but not necessarily tell anybody. And once that came out that so-and-so had had this and -and so-and-so had had that, they're like, so I'm not alone. You know, this is, this is, you know, your traditional thing, right? And then now we're starting to look at where the hot spots are. And I thought I, we've done some, some surveys and also some, some putting um, IMUs or inertial movement units on, on surgeons, looking at where in their surgery and also which surgery is most, um, has most awkward postures. And I can categorically say surgery is a pain in the neck because most of them are having neck problems. And so trying to figure out some intervention for that is our first goal. But there's a lot of impediments to that. One of the places that we have a lot of that is in plastic surgery for microsurgery. They, they're stuck to a microscope that goes over the, the bed. And so two people are looking into it. It doesn't have a lot of adjustability. So if there's a tall person like you, Blake, standing next to a short person like me, you're going and you're the surgeon you will adjust it for you and i'm going to get up on a step stool and i may be up on my toes for an eight ten hour surgery Hmm. wow that's really intense that is intense so i i I want to transition our topic into sort of how you got involved with the organization i know it's kind of a shift but no it um, isn't i want to see how you kind of got involved (laughs) with the organization and then maybe we can talk about sort of demystifying the the way that the organization is organized and, you know, talk about the various roles and technical groups um, and path to leadership. So I think of human factors as kind of my professional home and my family. And so in that, the technical groups are like neighborhoods. And so when I started out, I was a pretty traditional biomechanist. And so I went into the Industrial Ergonomics Technical Group, which is now called the Occupational Ergonomics Technical Group. And I was sitting there, and they were asking for volunteers. And I asked what the newsletter editor did. And then I was the newsletter editor. And from that, then I became the program chair and then the technical group chair. And when my job changed slightly, I went over to the product technical group. And I was the program chair there and the technical group chair. And I judged awards there. And then, then as that sort of grew, I got on some other committees, and then I ended up on the executive committee 
because I wanted to impact the whole society, not just my neighborhood. I wanted to do my city. And so I wanted to look at what that did. And I then was on the executive committee and was able to formulate policy for the entire society. And then I ran for president, which is a job where you're president elect for the first year, president for the second, and past president for the third year of the three year term. Yeah, so I want to kind of back up and, and just kind of say, is involvement enough? And then what, if not, then what else do you have to do to kind of uh, continue the progression within the organization? That's a great question. Um, for involvement, it, it was allowing me to then know, because I didn't know you, Nick, before today, and I didn't know Blake either. And I didn't feel like if I wanted to make a podcast that I could call you and say, hi, I don't know you. Can I make a podcast? Platform's yours now. <laughs> <laughs> You're in it now. <laughs> but now I know you and I feel more comfortable. So knowing the person face to face and having that, that even short interaction allows me to feel much more comfortable in my neighborhood. We all came up out of our houses and we had neighbor night, not neighbor night out. And so that's one reason to come to the conference and then interact because it's really networking. And so a lot of people have gotten jobs from that, gotten other interactions, put together proposals, written papers together. It's a great uh, place for you to share and to get to know other people. That's great. That's great. I, I want to get into sort of the organization, right? Okay. So. Can you kind of go over sort of how at a, at a higher level what HFES looks like? Okay. So the executive committee is made up of six representatives at large, and they each have three-year terms. So each two of them are for each year, and they rotate on each year. And then there's, two, there's three um, secretary treasurers, elect current and past okay. three presidents elect current and past and that group makes the policy for all of the other committees and technical groups and so there's the technical program committee and there's a lot of other committees but they're all arranged within domains and there's an outreach domain i'm going to forget one without an org chart there's the internal yeah. affairs domain there is the um education domain and there's a fourth one there's a fourth one we'll, we'll put an org chart in, <laughs> in our show notes so that way people can find out and what's really nice is that gives some junior leadership skills to the domain chairs and within the domains there are different committees that one can be on so there's there's for example i'm also the chair of the ac williams junior product system product design award and that's something that I've done for a while. I was on the committee for a while and just recently chaired it. And I will now be rolling off looking for somebody else to do that as a leadership opportunity because then you judge other people's work and make a recommendation to the awards chair who then at the annual meeting gets up and reads off all the awardees. Yeah. Do you have something? I, I don't know. This is... <laughs> it's, this it's is, sort of... I'm, I, if I had a piece of paper or a whiteboard, I could draw it out for you. Oh, for sure. No, <laughs> it's... This is... I think what is really kind of blowing my mind, or at least this is my kind of take on it, and I think it's important for our listenership to kind of internalize this and think about it, is a lot of this kind of kicked off from just volunteering to do something. Yes. To write the, ner the newsletter, and, and this is where you've taken it. Right. But the... The, the deal is that there's an opportunity to volunteer at whatever level you are comfortable with and with whatever amount of time you have to donate. It is a volunteer organization. And so if you don't have a lot of time, there is something that you can do that might be, you say, I have a week to give. I can review papers for the HFES conference because those are due within a, sor a fairly short period of time and you review five of them. It may take you a couple of hours. And you've done service to your society. And you feel like you're a part of it. And then the next year you go, I could probably do more. Maybe I'll volunteer to be on the outreach committee and go to a school and talk about, um, we had a plenary on school violence. Talk about that in ergonomics. Or talk about 
you know, the Stroop test. Explain that. Go judge a science fair for sure. human factors. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you might do in your regular life that would also be human factors related and volunteering for the society. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of avenues to kind of get involved. And, and like you said, there's varying degrees of involvement, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's the short time commitments, like maybe perhaps chairing a session or, or a you know, too. chairing a session, reviewing papers. But then there's also the more intense commitments, like being on a committee. Um, so I, I guess, you know, we're running a little short on time, but I do want to ask you just a couple kind of wrap up questions. If <clears throat> a lot of our listeners might be sort of uh, early on in their career or, or mid career, mm -hmm. what's one piece of advice that you wish you knew starting out in the field that you can sort of pass on to others? That people are giving in this organization. If you go up to them and say, I need advice, they will give it to you, whether you want it or not sometimes. <laughs> but, but also that, that if you volunteer and you are authentic in what you want to do, you really can do anything within this organization. It's very broad, but it's also very deep. It, it has a, a broad range of topics, but a lot of those topics can go into very high detail. There's a place for everybody at the table. And I feel like it's a great opportunity to volunteer and see what you do and don't like. What I do at the conference typically is my role at Mayo Clinic is in healthcare. I go to some healthcare things, but I also look at what's going on in surface transportation or augmented intelligence or some other places that are not in my comfort zone. And I then go and see what they're doing to see if it's something that I can adapt to what I need as well. And so the conference itself is a place where we can then learn new things and the, hopefully as a junior, whatever, mid-career, whatever, you're always going to be learning. Yeah. And this is an, an awesome opportunity. And you can go up to the person who just gave a talk and say, okay, so you made a new model. Can you explain that to me a little bit better? I missed this piece. And they will do it. They will love yeah. to do that with you. It's an excellent opportunity, I, I think. Um, so, Susan, where can our listeners go if they want to find out more about HFES or see that org chart <laughs> or, or follow you and your research? So the main HFES site is HFES.org. And within that, that's going to be changing a little bit. We're going to an uh, association management company. And we will now, once you log in as a member have a, a dashboard, it will start sometime later this year, early next year, where you can put in the things that you're interested in, and that will be on your personalized homepage. Excellent. And so that will allow you to, to get things that you want. That also is the place where the org chart is. Um, and my personal homepage is at the Mayo Clinic, and it is being put together right now, and it will be up shortly. And it will be on the screen, hopefully, when you see this <laughs> yeah, we'll, podcast. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely put a, uh, a link to the, that once it's up. We'll put a link to that in our show notes. And, we'll, if, and, and until then, you can go to Mayo <laughs> Clinic and just put in mayoclinic.org, and one word, and um, put in my last name, Hallbeck, H-A-L-L-B-E-C-K. I'm the only one there. And it should pull up my lab page. So there you can go. see what we're doing. Awesome. Well, Susan, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate your time and commitment to the organization. Um, so one fun thing that we like to do at the end of every show is say, it depends, because as you know... Oh, that's my favorite answer. <laughs> right? There you I, go. Exactly. I actually use that in class. I'd, I'd freak out people and say, the, the answer in this class is, it depends. But and you need to tell me what it depends upon. Exactly. So that's, <laughs> that's what we like to end on. So I'll just count us down and we'll end with It Depends. Ready? Right. Three, two, one. It, it Depends. depends.